The Living Zen Podcast is a gift from the members and associates of the Victoria Zen Center to you. If you enjoy it, please be sure to let your friends know about Living Zen. If you'd like to support our community, here are a few ways that you can do it. Download the Living Zen Podcast app for iPod, iPhone, or Android. You can also purchase additional Zen Talks by Venerable Eshu on iTunes or Amazon.com. One of the most meaningful ways to show your support is by joining our Sangha as an associate. Your commitment of $10 a month will ensure that offerings like the Living Zen Podcast and our online eZendo will continue to be available around the world to everyone with an interest in truly living Zen. To become an associate, please visit our website at www.zenwest.ca and click on the membership tab. Thank you for your support. Muman Khan Case 46 Shi Shuang Go Beyond the Top of a Pole The priest Shi Shuang said, How do you go beyond the top of a pole 100 feet high? Another ancient master said, You who sit on top of sit on the top of a pole 100 feet high, even though you have entered the way, you cannot be said to be truly free. Take a step from the top of the pole and manifest your complete body in the worlds of the ten directions. Wu Men says, Stepping forward, transforming, manifesting, is there anything to reject as ignoble or unworthy? Be that as it may, just tell me how you go beyond the top of a pole 100 feet high. Sa! Wu Men's verse says, some blind the eye in the forehead and cling to one mark on the scale, throwing away body free from life and death. The blind one leads the blind. Okay, so... Uh, this uh, is not such a, a difficult case, but uh, really relies on an experiential grasp of practice. Um, so, uh, as always, I think the first place to start is with uh, engaging with this um, case, not as a historical uh, document, not as some story about these old guys saying stuff long ago in China, as I always uh, point to you or uh, expect of you to engage with this, to involve yourself in this in a personal way. And so much I encourage you to do this that sometimes when I get into the sort of transcribing this stuff, uh, uh, I personalize it or I uh, press it to you uh, directly uh, because I think that this is the intention. So there's a bit of a story behind this uh, case that I want to talk about, but it's summed up in the first line. The priest Shi Shuang said, how do you go beyond the top of a pole 100 feet high? So we have to put ourselves at the top of this 100-foot pole, looking out at the vast expanse, looking out at this great panorama, this great accomplishment. It, um, it reminds me of, uh, we were just talking about this yesterday in my family, uh, we went to the BC Forestry Museum some time ago, in October, I think it was, for a field trip with my son's homeschool. And we looked at all these machines and heard about all these uh, stories. But the thing that really shocked me or uh, impressed me the most was they had this brief video of this man who sort of uh, throws a rope around this massive tree and you know starts his chainsaw and, and starts climbing up this big tree with a rope, I don't know, as big as my leg around maybe, 
and some spikes on his boots and that's it and and he just climbs up and he climbs up and he climbs up and he would come to this branch and he would cut the branch off just you know a foot above his rope <laughs> with this chainsaw and the camera would show the branch falling and falling and falling and falling and falling and falling and it just disappears and you never saw it hit the ground it was so high up and he continues to go up and up and up and finally he gets to this point i don't know what the determining factor is but uh, it's the point where maybe it's it's small the tree is small enough for his chainsaw blade to get through it i don't know but he eventually sort of chops the top off of this massive tree and it also falls into this abyss and then after he's done that before he continues with his work he actually climbs on to the sort of flat top of this tree and i don't know how many hundreds of feet up this is but he stands up there he stands up just on his feet up there and i'm sure he's looking from the top of this tree and actually as the camera looks around it's an amazing view and actually looking down onto the top of the forest the rest of the forest it's huge so the question becomes where do you go from there and this of course, in, in, the, in this case, as it pertains to practice, uh, this realization of unification, oneness, or shunyata, emptiness, manifesting our true nature is this uh, uh, pinnacle, this sort of peak experience, this, the heights of Zen practice. And this case, uh, as we're getting towards the end of the Muman Khan, there are many of these cases that talk about, uh, in the beginning, the, the effort or the practice or how to engage with your experience to facilitate this experience, to facilitate this awakening. In Japanese, they refer to it as Satori or Kensho, this sudden uh, realization where the experience of our lives, the, the experience of what these teachings are pointing to, makes a sudden shift from being a conceptual framework which we can sort of get on board with, or a, a series of ideas and philosophies that we find sort of consistent or appealing and we follow and practice, to this sudden experience, our own experience of this unification, that this teaching that points to things being not separate, things being uh, impermanent, um, becomes something which we can uh, smell and taste and touch, something that uh, becomes the very breath that we breathe. It's not a, a philosophical intellectual conceptual teaching anymore it is just as clear as the nose on our face it is the only thing that's happening ah and this is the experience of that standing on the top the flat top of that tree or as is expressed here by priest shishuang uh, sitting on top of this hundred foot pole and it's wonderful and the view is wonderful. Complete emptiness, complete unification. But as uh, Joshi Roshi always used to say, uh, there are no restaurants and there are no toilets, so we cannot stay. So the question becomes, how do you go beyond the top of a pole 100 feet high? Where do you go from here? How do you manifest? Once you have grasped this experience, once you have uh, had this, penetrated this, once your eyes have been opened, what, n what next? What then? That's what this question is about. And we have to understand that this is a question historically being posed in a monastery. It's historically being posed to individuals who have left home in the pursuit of awakening, of realization. This 
case or this practice is one that uh, we can bump up against in a million different ways and practice. I think with uh, lay people, one of the ways that I often see this case come up or experience this this issue is in relationship. And so when I was training, one of the questions or one of the cases that I often heard about people being asked to deal with was how do I manifest unconditional love when I'm seeing a stone or when I'm seeing a flower? And the idea is that in our lives, we tend to make relationship as incomplete. So I am incomplete and I am looking for that special person that will complete me. And I don't know if this is some kind of Western thing or a something that we got from the Romantic era or something like this. But this idea seems very strong in our culture. Maybe it's a Christian. I don't know. I don't know where it comes from. But it's a... Uh, and my personal feeling is that it's a sickness, actually, that we have in our culture. Uh, that we're brought up to believe that somehow we are incomplete, a half a person. And that our mission in life, our goal in life and relationship, is to go around and find this, uh, uh, we have this term soulmate, and it seems to me like, Only can we become a complete soul or a complete being when we find this matching peace. And so when we go into relationship, we go as something which is fundamentally broken. And when we make relationship, we make relationship still only manifesting to half, only being a half in this relationship. And... When we find that relationship, we say, oh joy, oh bliss. Finally, we have come to this position of absolute completion and forevermore that feeling of lacking, that feeling of being incomplete will be gone and I won't have to have that difficulty anymore. And so, uh, as time passes... And we begin to uh, argue about uh, how much salt to put in dinner and uh, which way to sling the toilet paper roll. Does it hang from the bottom or does it go over the top? And before long we think, maybe, maybe I've made this terrible mistake. Maybe this other half isn't my other half. And so then... We think, we look around and we start seeing all these other beautiful other halves wandering around out there. And we say, oh, I've made a terrible mistake. I've gone and connected myself to this person who isn't my other half. And I'm sure that one of those other lovely other halves out there is my true other half. And then we uh, start to really look at this other person we're in relationship and say, oh my God, what was I thinking? How could I have been so foolish to have bound myself to this? And then the next thing we know, we find ourselves single again, but still bound up in this half-person thinking. We find ourselves once again in the depths of despair because we are only half, incomplete. And we pine and pine and pine for the other perfect half. And we go around, maybe this one, maybe this one, maybe this one. And we can find that if we go about our lives this way, that sooner or later, maybe if we're lucky, some awareness develops that we're following a a circle, we're following a cycle. And we repeat this cycle over and over and over again. And uh, different people, we all have our cycle. And sometimes it is with uh, relationships, but sometimes it's with uh, work, job, career, 
Sometimes it's with education. Sometimes it's with our home living uh, environment. And the cycle is exactly the same that we, you know, desire and accomplish and then stagnate and then uh, leave or, or drop or split away from and then desire and then pursue, accomplish, stagnate. You know, it's this round and round and round. And so what uh, happens in Zen practice or in formal Zen practice when we're talking about doing it in this kind of monastic environment is there's this conscious sort of uh, uh, leaving. Uh, And in uh, monastic practice, I guess you could say the idea of enlightenment or awakening becomes the perfect partner or becomes the perfect environment or becomes the perfect uh, work. And in many ways, uh, the beauty of the monastic environment is that it can so neatly wrap all of these desires into one thing to do. Just go to the monastery. You'll have this perfect place to live and these perfect brothers and sisters or brothers or sisters. You'll have this perfect teacher with this perfect teaching and won't everything be wonderful. And so when uh, Ro- uh, Joshi Roshi was dealing with students um, who fell into the sickness, particularly with uh, relationships, one of the strategies and the way that the traditional approach of uh, celibacy was expressed to me was that it is an, is an antidote, it is a medicine uh, Many people look at this practice of celibacy as sort of like this sort of across the board thing. You know, anyone who becomes a monk should practice celibacy. But we also see that medicine, when it is misused, when it's uh, uh, applied in the wrong place, can cause illness. Um, And there's lots of places where we can witness that. I don't think I need to name them expressly. But in the right place, at the right time, this can be a very powerful tool. And in fact, I think that if you haven't gone through a period of celibacy in your life, I mean voluntary celibacy, uh, it's a very valuable practice. And what we find is that in the beginning, it's like a cruel punishment. It's like this imposition of this terrible thing. And the, the Roshi would often not just impose celibacy. It's not just about celibacy. But it's like no relationships. No relationships for you, he would say. And the person would say, really? And he'd say, yes, no relationship. Manifest, first manifest unconditional love with a stone. So the practice becomes, how do you become complete? How do you become complete when you're not looking for your completion in other, in something outside? How do you manifest wholeheartedly? How do you come to completion just in this very body? Because this is the manifestation of unconditional love. True love does not require other. And so what happens is, as a person continues through practice, and as a person continues in relationship, not having these sort of external relationships, a person can become happier and happier and happier just by themselves. Until this desire to go and find some other person, this desire to complete oneself in relationship to another person, or as the case may be in uh, this particular environment or with this particular education or with this particular job or with this particular object, I'll be complete when this thing starts to diminish as we engage in this voluntary practice of restraint. Ah, And then this switch flips where we are engaged in this practice where it's difficult. It's difficult on a daily basis not to to pay attention to this craving, this desire for other. 
And every day we're exerting ourselves, we're, we're spending our energy on just bringing our awareness to this. In a classical sense, we're paying attention to the practice of awakening. We're paying attention to what distracts us, what confounds us, what upsets us. And then suddenly there comes this day where we wake up and there is no thought. There is no thought about finding completion in other. There is no thought about, uh, 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 oh, I need to find somebody to share the rest of my life with, or, oh, I need to find a better place to live, or, oh, I need to find a, a better job, a more, satisf- a more important job, and morally a better job. We come to this place where there is this deep satisfaction in the experience of this very moment. In practice, we have this uh, moment where all of a sudden, Buddhism, Zen, all of these uh, complex teachings suddenly drop away and there is the utter simplicity of just having a cup of tea, just manifesting in this moment. This is the point that uh, we find ourselves on top of the hundred-foot pole. And it's very comfortable. And this is, uh, my, uh, Joshi Roshi, when I talked to him about practicing as a monk at Mount Baldy, uh, he made it very clear that this word monastery uh, is an English word, which... Uh, talks about isolation. It, it's a, to, to go and it's a retreat from society. And in the Christian sense, when a person enters the monastery, it's totally normal and it, it's totally expected and indeed maybe welcomed that what a person is doing is leaving the world. And the idea is that you would go to the monastery and that you would practice there. And if, it, if, you know, if your spirit was right, that you would stay there until the moment that you die. But in the Zen tradition, this, this is not the case. This is not the case anywhere. Uh, and he said the term for the training center is Senmon Dojo. It means training center. So the idea is that you go there for a period of time to uh, focus, to have this experience, to... Uh, engage in a practice in a structured, supportive environment which is entirely focused, which is entirely structured to provoke awakening. Having accomplished that, having uh, developed functionality, you are thrown out. Go back. The idea is to be of benefit to all sentient beings. And from the beginning of monastic practice in Buddhism, there is the recognition that you don't do so much uh, good just hanging around the monastery. Even at the time of Buddha, they would have these sort of the rains retreats. When the, when the rains, rainy season started, all the monks would uh, cloister together. And then when the rainy seasons ended, they would disperse. They'd go back to your home village and share what was realized in this uh, retreat season, in this rainy retreat season. So this is a uh, case which is aimed at that very moment of realization. That very moment uh, where suddenly at the monastery, is very funny, uh, Roshi... uh, I have to sort of address it from the male perspective, although it happens in the female perspective as well. Uh, After years of, you know, having this conversation with students where the student would come in and say, you know, God, you know, Roshi, I, I, you know, practicing here is great and I'm getting so much out of it, but I so, uh, you know, when I see a woman, then... I think, oh, it would be so wonderful, especially this woman, or uh, what do you think about so-and-so? I think she would make a wonderful wife, and she has this Zen practice, and wrote, no, no, no relationship, no relationship. 
And then that conversation, that um, interaction, that sort of anguished uh, questioning ceases after some point. And this individual comes into interview stronger and stronger, happier and happier. And then all of a sudden, they're like, getting invested in the monastery. And you can see that there's this transition where the the desire or the interest even in having relationship diminishes. And I like to call this sort of phase the stone mountain where, you know, like a beautiful woman comes up and the, the, the person doesn't notice at all. Like not just isn't moved by it, but like doesn't notice. And so that's the point where Roshi would start to say, oh, so-and-so looks very pretty today. This is the Joshi Roshi's uh, asking this question. Once you've hit the top of the 100-foot pole, how do you manifest? We're not engaged in this practice so that we can enjoy a lofty expanse. We're not engaged in this practice of awakening so that we can be satisfied with this uh, uh, beautiful panorama, this singular experience, this uh, realization. What next? And this is what this next piece talks about. Another ancient master said, this other ancient master was Cheng Sha, and he and another monk named Hui were students of Nanchuan, uh, or Nansen. So they were contemporaries to uh, Chao Chu, Zhou Xu, the great Zhou Xu. And so these two, uh, Changsha and Hui, were brother monks training at the same time under Nanshuan in the monastery. And after a certain period of time in Zen practice as a Zen monk, just as I was talking about before, uh, the teacher's job and the, the, the function of the training center is to um, allow these people, facilitate these individual monks in their training to the point where this uh, experience begins to open up. This awakening starts to uh, manifest in their daily lives. And um, to nurture that, to cultivate that. But at every monk's, in every monk's career, in every monk's path, there comes a point where they're able to access this experience. They're able to uh, witness the teaching, the Dharma, not just coming out of the teacher's mouth, not just in interactions with other monks, not just in the context of the monastery, but moment to moment in the blossoming of the cherry trees in the spring, in the sound of the birds flying through the trees, that this teaching becomes more and more available to them. And it's at this point where usually a teacher will say, you know, You've been taking up the space in this monastery for a very long time, and maybe it's time that you move on. And they they say uh, in this this uh, text, uh, it's their point of independence. And so, what happens to a monk after that is they go forward to practice and investigate the Dharma using the tools that they've cultivated in their monastic practice independently. So, uh, oftentimes it involves a practice, a period of solitary practice. There's a very strong hermit culture in uh, ancient China, and even to this day there are still hermits in the mountains of China all over the place. And so, and then uh, a person may uh, choose to remain a hermit. People choose a path. Uh, based on their own skills and uh, personal assets. That's how we'd call it today. But in maybe in the old world, they would say uh, they choose a path based on their own individual karma. Some people are great speakers. Some people are very powerful 
meditators. Some people are great artists, and so they go forward and interact with the world in a way which uh, befits them. So we have two characters here. One is uh, Chang Sha, the other is Hui. And Chang Sha, we know, later went on to become an abbot and to develop a significant training community. And Hui uh, remained a hermit. Um, and that's where the, this quote comes from, is that one day Chang Sha is wondering how Hui is doing. And so he asks one of his students, he says, you know, uh, my brother Hui is living up in the mountain. And I wonder if you would go and visit him and see how he's doing. And he instructs him on how to question him. So really, he's poking at Hui to see what's going on there. And as a stick, he's using one of his own students. Maybe uh, maybe the student has this um, propensity towards isolation, towards... Uh, uh, Purity, I guess you could say, the purity of practice. So he sends him to see Hui. And so when he arrives, he's instructed to ask the question, How was it before you met Nanchuan? And in response, Hui just sits silently. And after some time, Hui says, What about after you met Master Nanchuan. And Hui uh, responds, it's nothing special. So the monk returns to uh, Changsha and reports what happens. And this is, uh, the way that I phrased it in this case is actually directed at you. But the way that uh, Changsha said it was, he sits on top of a pole 100 feet high. Even though he has entered the way, he cannot be said to be truly free. He must take a step from the top of the pole and manifest his complete body in the worlds of the ten directions. So this is a very direct verse. Where our practice is not uh, for the practice of. It's not for its own sake that we practice. And here at the Victoria Zen Center, it's why I am very hesitant to getting the Zen Center as an organization involved in uh, particular sort of like charitable works or particular sort of movements or particular uh, sort of social uh, 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 action, I guess you could say. Because I don't think that it's our position here at the center to direct that. Each of us, when we come to the Zen center, our focus is to awaken. Our focus is to realize this fundamental emptiness. To grasp this experience through practice and interaction for ourselves. How we manifest that, how we go forward as individuals or even as groups of individuals together with friends or, or uh, partners that we meet or practice with at the Zen Center, uh, this is what this case is about. All of the uh, uh, teaching, what it's pointing to, all of this Dharma, is to be experienced. Our focus at the Victoria Zen Center, our mission at the Victoria Zen Center, is to facilitate that, that experience. To manifest, to step down from the 100-foot pole, to go forward, to go beyond the top of the 100-foot pole, is the question of how do you manifest your life? 
knowing this, experiencing this, recognizing and realizing this for yourself, what now? How does it transform how you're interacting with the world, how you're making relationship, what you're doing for work, where you're living? This is what this case is pointing to. Wu Men says, uh, stepping forward, transforming, manifesting. So, this is our practice, having realized this, having experienced this, having recognized that fundamentally we are one. This vast cosmos, there is no separation, intimately connected, subject and object are not different. Is there anything to reject as ignoble or unworthy? Is there anything in this vast cosmos that we can just ignore, that we can just not be attentive to? Is there any moment of our lives, of our relationships, of the work that we do? Is there any corner, any moment of our time that we can just say, oh, this is a time to be relaxed and get nothing done. Be that as it may, just tell me how you go beyond the top of a pole 100 feet high. This is always the case with women. It's not about Shi Shuang. It's not about Chang Sha. It's not about Hui. And I found this very curious with Hui. Hui is E in Japanese. It's the first character in my name. It means wisdom. And what's very conspicuous about Brother Hui is that his name only has one character. And I don't know, this is just something I picked out this morning. What uh, is being pointed to here is that this practice that we have is two-sided. It's realization and manifestation. It is the experience of wisdom, but it's also the manifestation. Where do we go with that? How do we manifest? And uh, perhaps it's symbolic uh, that Hui uh, only has this wisdom, this experience, but does not manifest. Be that as it may, just tell me how you go beyond the top of a pole 100 feet high. Not about what so-and-so should do, or how so-and-so should make relationship, or what we should do about such-and-such in the environment, how we should fix things over there, or what we should do to clarify things over there. In our practice, this question points to how you manifest in this very moment, knowing what you know, having experienced what you've experienced, demonstrate this Dharma, demonstrate this wisdom, demonstrate this teaching. And women, at the end of this, says, and this uh, apparently is sort of what the Chinese say, like we would go, And it's kind of like, I've said too much. I've, I've gone on for too long. My voice is getting hoarse. If you don't get it by now, I really can't help you any further. That's this. <clears throat> Women's verse says, Some blind the eye in the forehead and cling to one mark on the scale. And this, of course, is referring to the third eye. And a lot of people uh, these days really take this third eye business very seriously and like you can massage the third eye and do all these kinds of exercises. And in uh, Buddhist iconography often, and Hindu as well, there's often this sort of, there is an eyeball between the the two eyes. But I can tell you that um, as far as I'm concerned and generally what I see in Zen literature is that this is we have to understand this as metaphorical. Uh, We have two eyes that look out, and when we close our eyes, 
uh, there is this other experience, uh, this other seeing which is reflective. It looks into the world of our mind, of our emotions, and it's always been referred to as the third eye. It's our third seeing, our other way of seeing. And so what this is pointing to is that if we stay in this state, if we uh, uh, don't sort of alternate, if we're not moving back and forth from realization to manifestation, we're diminishing the clarity of our inner eye. We're losing our ability to see with wisdom, this third eye. One uh, translation says they darken, uh, some darken the eye in the forehead and cling to one mark on the scale. And that's uh, what I'm talking about when I talk about sort of this, uh, once we have experienced this, once we have had this taste of unification or emptiness, We take it as just like any other accomplishment, whether it's a relationship or a job or a place or a fancy car or something like this. We look at it as fixed. We look at it as a landing ground or a finish line and we try to grasp it. And that's what uh, uh, women is pointing to here. Cling to one mark on the scale. So we just try to get to one thing and stay there. And this is the monk uh, who sits on the mountain, the hermit, Hui. Completely cut off from the world in his mountain hut. Oblivious, ignorant to the world around him. Throwing away body free from life and death. So, uh, This comes back to this metaphor of uh, being at the top of the pole or being, if you like, at the top of this topped tree standing there. In order to step forward, in order to go beyond the top of this pole, you have to be completely comfortable with letting what has been in the past die. You can't step from the top of that pole as you were. There's no keeping it. All that you've accomplished, you've accomplished, but now it comes time to let it go. Because in the end, our concern is not accomplishment. Our concern is continually awakening. What next? How do we manifest this fundamental activity? Throwing away body, free from life and death, transforming, transfiguring, manifesting appropriately in each situation without resistance, without clinging to what's been in the past and without projecting what we figure needs to happen in the future simply manifesting clearly in each situation. The blind one leads the blind. This is a great line that uh, it's a little bit, it's made a little bit difficult by the fact that we have a phrase very similar to this in English, the blind leading the blind, which is not a good thing. Uh, It leads to trouble. But the blind one leading the blind means this is the person who's uh, the individual becomes blind to um, uh, how can I put this as we walk around in the world we look at things as this and that we look at uh, we make our choices about what's important so often based on these subjective reasonings. This is uh, how we make our decisions. And when we 
practice, when we engage in this uh, realization of emptiness, shunyata, mu in the Japanese, um, our ability to see these things or uh, our... our fixation with them, our obsession with them, how seriously we take them diminishes. We begin to lose the eyesight of this faculty. So on one side, we can say, uh, in the beginning, just looking at things as uh, separate, uh, permanent, lasting, we're blind. We're blind to the other side of life. We're blind to... Uh, the unifying principle of all things. But also Wu Men says that we can be blind the other way, which is to say uh, we become blind to differentiation. And we use this fundamental unifying principle even though we're manifesting, even though we're interacting in the world of subject and object, we know that underneath, underlying this, this foundation of interconnectedness, of unification. So we become blind to this sort of um, delusion of uh, separateness. And this is what it's talking about here when it says throwing away body, throwing away the subjective, the specific, the physicality, throwing away our willingness to accept this as the way of things or the only way of things. We become free because we don't take our lives as being something which is uh, has a beginning and an end. And we don't take uh, our experiences as something which is finite but is intimate, uh, infinitely uh, intimate and which is constantly transforming. Grasping this, we have a situation where the blind one, blind to subject, object, leads the blind ones uh, blind to the unifying principle. So... Go beyond the top of a pole. In our relationships, in our work, in our living environment, both in a sort of microcosmic, in our households, in our houses, but also in our world. This vast uh, ecosystem, this planet, this, this universe. How... Do we recognize this fundamental unifying principle first, having grasped it, having embodied it, where do we go from there? Not where do they go, or how should they behave, but how do we manifest? How do you manifest from the top of a 100-foot pole? So Thanks for listening to the Living Zen podcast. If you follow Living Zen through iTunes, I would very much appreciate it if you would take a moment to let me know what you think about it by rating or reviewing the podcast so that new listeners can also hear what you have to say. Thank you for your time and for your support.